Um, so I'll just introduce you guys uh, to myself. Hopefully you can hear me really well um, and all of that. But I'm Ben, I am the shop manager up here at Eagle Crest and I've been doing this for four years, I wanna say now, but I've been tuning skis for a lot longer than that. Um, that being said, <laughs> I haven't been tuning skis forever. There's a lot of people in this town, especially like old school uh, race tuners and things like that that are definitely equally, if not more, qualified to be doing a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be going over today um, and this week. Um, but um, I still have a lot of expertise in these things. I see thousands of pairs of skis come through my door every year. Um, and one second. Turn off the hood thing. I'm so slow fired in here, easier for you to hear me. Um, to address something right off the bat, uh, up here at Eagle Crest, we are all wearing masks all the time. Um, it's really hard for you guys to hear me just in general in this kind of loud shop environment. Um, so I'm not wearing one. Um, all the doors are closed. This environment is basically my domain. Um, that being said, I still wear a mask all day. Um, it's just that we're doing this scenario and everybody's gone from the building. I'm the only one left at work. So, um, yeah. So, um, I'll jump right into it. So that's kind of who I am. And uh, before I was tuning skis up here at Eagle Crest, I was a racer for University of Wisconsin um, just for a little bit and just have continued to ski as a passion, but also as a definite life choice um, being involved in the industry as I am. And I, throughout kind of my learning process, as well as being part of a generation that's in this drastic change from hand tuning and kind of an old school skiing way to now shop tuning that's a lot better. Um, I've learned a lot about kind of both sides and so I think that benefits me in being able to teach as well as um, get down to the really, really fine elements of skiing that really help. So um, a little better, I guess part a little better. Um, so, what kind of sparked me thinking about doing this is the number of people that come in my door every day and just say, I need my skis tuned. And then you say, okay. Um, and it's not a problem because me as a shop tech and the people who work for me and have been trained by me as well as many other shop techs throughout the world, um, we're all, we know what that means. It means diagnose it ourselves and then tune it the way that we think you as a skier would like that ski tune. Um, and for the most part, that's a pretty rigid set of rules where we don't differ that much from one skier to another skier. Um, but it, things do change um, from skier to skier. And there's certain people where you tune your ski, their skis essentially how you would always tune a ski and they'll come back extremely angry um, at how it's tuned or vice versa where you'll tune a ski broccoli for the first time and somebody who's been skiing their whole life and has never experienced that will really love the response that that ski is giving now. Um, and so it got me thinking if more people could come to me and say, um, I would like my skis to be tuned this way. They're a little bit grabby off the tips um, and you know, various other things will go off. Will, learn about here, actually a lot of it today. Um, and uh, that would help me and all the shop techs really, really make things better for you. Now, sometimes I won't lie, people coming in and telling you that kind of information will seem like they might know what they're talking about. When they really know. Um, and that's oftentimes the case with um, people uh, of the older generation where things are totally changed now. And so the way that we tune skis and the way we do things are totally different and the way I would do it doesn't really correspond to what they're telling you. Now, if you really come in and, and obviously know what you're talking about and want your skis tuned a certain way, awesome. That is what we love and that's what we want to see. Um, so I want to prepare you guys to be able to do that. Also, um, that's going to be most of what today is but this whole course is gonna prepare you to use some of the fine tuning at home. So when you take it to a shop and we do the tuning um, very well, but to a very kind of standard, 
you then can go home and if you want to further tune your skis and make them react the way that you want. If somebody says, please don't detune my skis at all because I would like to detune them. Perfect. I know what they're talking about. I know they like, they know how they like to ski and how their ski reacts. And that's, that's great. Um, and I love that scenario. Um, sorry, I'm still messing with some stuff here. Obviously, um, shot, no, super optimized for streaming a video. Anyways, um, so uh, today we're going to go over kind of like the introduction to your gear. I want you guys, whether you're a skier or a snowboarder, to understand what everything on a snow skis looks like, or everything on a snowboard looks like, and how it should be set up perfectly. Where now you're the most comfortable um, and the most able to do your sport well, and then limited by your gear. You know, we've made insane progressions over the last 20 years or so in terms of how gear acts on the snow. And so, to have this great gear and technology and then ruin it with a bad tune is something that happens all the time. But, you know, I would like for you guys to feel what a tuned ski should feel like. And, uh, or snowboard. Um, definitely don't want you guys to think that this is going to be totally ski based. Most of this is going to be skis and snowboards. This first week is kind of more nitty gritty about how they work. And so I'll separately go into skis and I've got snowboards over here that I'll bring over when we're done. And we'll talk about both of them because they're really cool and they're different in same, some ways and really similar in some ways. Um, but yeah, we're going to start out with skis because I've kind of just got that set up right now. So um, the other thing I, that's really important, sorry, before we jump into things that I have to tell you is I'm not a certified teacher. So by coming out of this, you're not going to be a marker certified uh, technician. That's something that's pretty easy to get, to be completely honest. I shouldn't be telling you that, um, but it, that's kind of more of a formality. What you will know is how to do your own tuning, how to understand skis, and I, if you want to get into snow sports industry, that doesn't mean you're any less qualified now. You're actually a lot more qualified, um, but you'll need to go back through your tuning and, and that kind of stuff. This isn't going to give that to you, nor am I certified to give that to you. So that's an important distinction. Um, but still, I think people will find this informational and uh, I really hope it helps people. Um, so um, let's do an introduction to some of your gear now. Um, and while we do this, I'll kind of talk you guys through what you might need at each step of this. But the most important and first tool that you're definitely going to need, whether you're, mm, if you're a snowboarder, maybe not. Um, but if you're a skier, you absolutely will need this tool. I don't know how I managed to not bring one of these by, but that's this guy. This is a posse driver. Um, so this screwdriver looks almost identical to a Phillips screwdriver, um, but it's got this extra nick in between. And I really hope that you guys can see this. And this is again, why I'm kind of not doing the Instagram because it won't come through. Um, you won't be able to see that. As a matter of fact, I may have probably cut that feed here in a minute. Um, so you guys go through the, onto Facebook, we are the adventures, AK, or you can just find it off all the social media stuff that I post. Um, but yeah. Um, so this posse drive, um, is what everything with your ski is going to be used for. Now you might think using a Phillips is going to be perfectly fine if you're just using it a couple of times. That's actually not the case. This extra, um, notch in there is really important for your ski bonding function. Um, not only to make it be able to be tight in terms of us installing it, but even when you're adjusting your DIN and stuff like that, this is the guy that you're always going to want to be using. There's a couple of different sizes of this, but Posi Drive, I think kind of regardless of whether you want to do more tuning on your own or not, this is a good tool to put in your pack, your backcountry or something like that. They make lightweight versions of them in case something happens out there where you want this. Also, really nice to have a screwdriver to kick off snow and ice off your ski. Um, but this is going to be the one you need. Now, some ski bindings will also use a flathead, uh, mostly for in and uh, forward pressure setting. Um, but you'll know pretty obviously if that's one of your skis um, and you'll need a flathead as well. Unfortunately, almost all of them that use a flathead also use a posse drive. So it's pretty annoying because then you got to get the posse drive and the flathead every time. Really annoying as a shop tech, honestly, but even more annoying if you're trying to do your own stuff. Anyways, so positive drive is going to be what you want for your ski. Now, there are a ton of different ski bonding 
pipes. And within that, obviously, there's even more um, manufacturers and models and stuff like that. Um, but I want to give you guys an overview of each ski binding type and then how the ski binding function. So this is the easiest way to do both of them. And this is a rental setup. Um, so this is one of our rental skis up here at Eagle Crest. Uh, it's a marker vocal ski. So it has a vocal body on the ski and RT and then a marker binding with a pre-installed plate. Now this plate can't come off of the ski. Some retail demo or um, rail bindings will come off. You can uninstall it. These ones are specifically for a rental and so they will not. The important thing about that is if you own this ski, you cannot remount it. So when this binding becomes unindemnified, which is to say no shop will work on it anymore, you can't buy a new binding and put it on this ski. Now the massive upside to this ski is this. It doesn't matter what size your boot is, your boot can fit in this ski no matter what. So if you're a huge footed person who's five foot two, ski like this makes it really easy for you to own a setup, but also to be able to resell it. Because if you mount that to your weird specifications, I'm sorry, I just can't think of another word about it, but your unusual like body arrangement, then it's gonna be really hard to sell that setup because you're gonna have to either find somebody who's gonna wanna remount it or somebody who's gonna fit that as well. Um, this will kind of avoid that, it's really nice. It's, why what, it's what we use in a rental shop. The reason I picked this out first though, is because you can slide these completely off and you can look at the binding, which is not something you can normally do um, with a normal ski. And these bindings are really, really, really simple. Um, I guess before I talk about how this binding works, we'll talk to you about, um, I'm really bad at that, DIN, which is what those numbers are corresponding to and what that screw corresponds to, the one on the top right here. Um, so DIN is a calculated release setting. It has to do with your height, your weight, your skier type, and your age to some extent. And it all goes off a standardized chart. So if you were becoming marker certified or any certified tab, this chart is your lifeblood. And I'm not gonna teach it to you because I'm not sure if I'm actually allowed to um, but also because this, um, it's just, we'll do it. Like, this is why we're here. And you can learn on your own. This is super simple. You can go on YouTube, I'm sure, and find a video of how to read this chart. It's not that bad. But what this chart does is allows you to key in your weight, your age, your skier type, and your height, and get a, a skier code. And from this skier code, that is your DIN placement. And then depending how big your foot is, your ding goes up and down corresponding to that. So um, we use this chart. Actually, we, by law, have to use this chart. So if you bring in a ski to us and ask us to do what's called a test and adjust, we're fitting your boot to your ski, and then we're using that chart to calculate your din. And um, the... I'll go, I'll talk a little bit about age because it's kind of a weird one. So kids under 10 and adults over 50, actually 49, um, your DIN is actually lower because as a ski tech, you always are erring on the side of caution. So essentially when you read this chart, you always are gonna be erring on the side of caution. That's the hardest thing to teach with it is you're always erring on the side of a lesser number of din and a lesser din corresponds to less pressure than it takes to release your foot out of your body so um kind of an abstract concept until you can physically see these numbers right here and these are torque numbers that say that if your din is what it is on your binding. If it's set at a two and it says two on your binding, it is going to absolutely take that much pressure to release your foot from that binding. 
And the way that we test that, and the reason it's called a test and adjust, is with a torque gun, and it reads you pressure, as long as you're setting everything up correctly, so I'm showing it to the other cameras as well, um, but the reason why you adjust this is if you set up a binding to a certain DIN and it doesn't read the correct pressure, well, now you have to compensate or the binding is just flat out broken. And the reason why that doesn't happen very often and these bindings are so good is because they're so simple. Really, really simple concept. Um, it's actually not great to see with this. So let me grab a different type of binding. Now, this is kind of an exaggeration because this, what I'm telling you about this binding is not actually the case, um, but the concepts are still true. So with this binding, you've got this screw right here, or this spring right here. And then you've got this screw right here, and then you've got your DIN meeting on the top. So DIN, screw, and then Sorry, your spring on the side here. Now, this spring is simply attached to this screw. And as you screw this screw in, this spring gets smaller and smaller and your DIN gets bigger and bigger. And all this spring is doing is choosing when your foot is in this down position and when your foot is in the ski, it's gonna be really hard, but in the up position as a binding normally would set. And so when you go from up to down, it releases the spring and how much tension is on the spring is your din. And all they did was put that, you know, cause it might be 165 nanom, uh, whatever the heck the pressure reading is, Newton meters of force um, on it. They correspond that to like two or 2.5 or three. And it goes all the way up to like the highest suggested dins are around 13.5 or 14, I think said. If you're racing, you can see DIN settings up to 18, 20 sometimes. Um, but as you can imagine, as your DIN goes up higher and higher, it becomes more and more dangerous because you're never going to release from your ski. When you crash, the safest thing for uh, like your ski to do and to happen when you crash is your ski instantly goes off and does its own thing. And then you are just a human being. I'm terrified of mountain biking. Because when I'm mountain biking, if I fall, I'm getting mangled in my bike. It doesn't eject and go out unless I learn how to push my bike out and eject it. With skis, they already basically are supposed to do that if it's set up correctly to your height, your weight, your age, and your skier type. That being said, you don't want your dead too light because in deep snow or in conditions that are somewhat variable, a, uh, ski that's popping off all the time will also be super dangerous. You can imagine you're going up to a cliff or like a high pressure situation and you make a hard cut and your ski pops off. Well, now you're really in a dangerous situation. So that's why it's really important to bring uh, your skis to a shop and get them tested um, and then to get them retested. Doesn't have to be every year, but every time a shop touches your boot and readjusts your ski, they're going to retest your body. They legally have to. That's why if you get your binding mounted at some places, they'll tell you you have to go somewhere else to get it tested before you actually ski on it. They legally have to tell you to do that. The reason for that is because this little pork meter right here is about $5,000. And a small shop might not want to spend that much money to do to get one. It only lasts for a couple of years. You have to get it recalibrated and all that good stuff. So it's a really expensive tool, but a really important tool. As far as I know, we're really the only place in Juno, if you are watching from Juno, that has a proper torque gun and can perform these tests. It's not to say there's not other good shot techs in Juno. And a lot of you guys are good shot techs. Um, and you can operate as a really good shot tech out of your garage. But the one thing you can't do is assure binding safety. Um, without that gun, there's really no other way to simulate it. Um, and so that's why it's really important to bring it up to what's called like a marker certified pet or a shop or whatever manufacturer. I'm certified with every single binding manufacturer you can imagine. Um, so whatever you bring me, I can work 
um, or I'm at least very familiar with. So um, that is your rental ski and the rental binding. And you can see how easy that is to just pull that back in and now you've got a fully functional ski. It's really awesome. Um, it really changes the name of the game. Um, moving in from there, in terms of compatibility, you have a normal demo rail. So as opposed to the rental binding um, or those demo bindings that also look very similar to the rental binding, this is kind of a true demo binding. And this is a really interesting one because it's also a pin binding. Um, but we'll talk about touring bindings in a little bit. The only reason I'm looking at this right now is because here you can see on this binding, so I have everything backwards because I'm not used to talking to the camera, but everything on this binding right here is the same where you can adjust it to your boot length and then you have a fully set up uh, system for your boot. Now what's really important and what's really nice about that one versus this one is because only one part of this moves imagine if you have a really big boot and it's far forwards you're slightly further forwards on the ski now you might want that but you might also want to be dead center on the ski which is where you're usually mounting is is your boot center or a recommended mid center mounting point and usually you want to be around that now being up and down that like even plus one minus one in terms of centimeters so 10 millimeters either way not the biggest deal really at all um, but once you start getting higher than that, sometimes you'll really feel the responsiveness of the ski change. Um, so riding further back kind of better in powdery conditions, riding kind of forwards better in uh, icier rooming situations where you're not going to the deep. It also depends on what your ski shape is and yada, yada, all that kind of stuff. Um, so um, that's kind of what this ski binding um, type looks like. Now, we're going to go to just a normal now alpine bounding and this is kind of the same thing as what i just showed you um, with that heel piece in the or that i pulled out there um, this is actually the same binding it's a marker binding um, but it's just a mounted heel piece and a mounted toe piece and as you can see there's a spot here that says recommended and it's mounted center to that spot now, if I put a boot in this, okay, I have to do some stuff real quick. Okay, sorry about that. Now, if I put a boot in this, And this is set up correctly, which let's pray that it is because these are my skis. It's also really hard to put a boot in on a vise that doesn't have a bottom, but we'll try it. Try it out. There we go. Now, if this is all set up correctly, the mid mark, so that A, if you can see it on the ski or on the boot there, there's a little line that says A should line up exactly with that silver mark. That's the recommended mark on the ski. And it does. It's exact because I mounted this and you would really hope that I'm doing my work. Um, that being said, I did get out to ski the other day and all of my forward pressures on my skis were off. So another reason why you want to have that positive drive handy when you ski Sometimes you just get into your stuff and things change. I don't know why it happens or how it happens, but it does sometimes. You really can't hurt to have that. That being said, if you're not comfortable making those adjustments, bring it to a shop. They're always happy to make it for you and way safer for you to do it that way if you're not comfortable with it. Now, I talked about forward pressure a couple of times and forward pressure is the most important thing about your ski, even more important than your dip. If your forward pressure is not set up correctly, then your din doesn't matter. And so your forward pressure always has something called a forward pressure indicator. And on this binding, it's this pin right here. And if this pin is flush to the back of the heel housing, then it is set correctly. And this is. And all that means is that this back here, it moves, oh, this is hard to see, 
moves on a track. So you can see that track right there. If it didn't move on that track, when you mounted your ski to your boot, it would be like that for the rest of the, of the life of the ski. And that sucks. That would be, I mean, skiing is already such an expensive sport to get into. They don't need to be making it more expensive. So this moves back and forth, this heel piece here, will all move back and forth. So when you move it back and forth, what you're looking for is to set that forward pressure so that the binding is set up exactly correctly. That indicator is reading the amount of pressure that's being put on the heel piece by this boot. And if the right amount of pressure is being put on the heel piece and that forward pressure reads correctly, well then your ski is set up well and then you can go from there going about your din and going about all your other settings on the ski. Also, this is the vertical position for the binding that I was talking about before. Um, just like that. So forward pressure, super important. That is kind of an industry secret. Now, it's not that everybody doesn't know what forward pressure is. It's just that there's these tech manuals that you have to get to get the new forward pressures on the new skis. Now, an intuitive tech, like I could tell you exactly what the forward pressure is going to be on pretty much every ski, just because I've seen so many different systems. But if you haven't seen thousands of different types of skis, it might not be really obvious. As a matter of fact, sometimes they like to trick you. So there's a version of this exact same binding where instead of the screw being flush to the heel housing, it has to be in line with a certain mark that's on this screw. And so by doing that, they make it so your forward pressure could be extremely incorrect unless you have the shop tech manual, unless you know that and are retesting every year and recertifying every year. So that's one of those kind of tricky things where it might seem really intuitive. Oh, you put your ski boot in and then if it fits right and it goes in, you're good, you know? But one or two, you know, quarters of a turn on a positive drive on this heel piece can completely change your forward pressure, um, like to a huge extent. So I don't know if I'll be able to really show you guys this, but I'm just going to, you saw it was flush to the heel housing before. If I just do one quarter turn in here, it's now actually inside the heel housing and so it's really hard to show you guys um but that's why really understanding forward pressure is more a fact of just testing and being up in the industry than being smart about skis so even if you think you know what you're doing you actually might need it. um and it's messed me up plenty of times trust me um, so nothing bad there or anything like that but um the last part of a ski binding, most ski bindings, about 99% of them, uh, actually that's not true. I said about 50% of ski bindings have this feature. Kids bindings typically will not. Uh, race bindings typically will not. Rental and rail bindings, demo bindings typically will not. So a normal Alpine bind, geez, Alpine binding is going to have it and almost every single one will. Other situations might not have it, but it's called toe height. So, one of the most important parts of your ski binding is called your AFD plate, anti-friction device. And it's this silver piece right here. And even though this one is real old and real dry, it still moves freely from side to side. It does catch a little bit. And that's actually something I'm noticing about this ski that I'll probably take care of later. But you want that to freely move. But everybody's boot is different, right? So, I don't know, you've probably seen just normal boots with a flat boot sole on the bottom. This is a uh, Vibram sole on a touring boot. This is way thicker, way wider, and it interacts differently because it's rubber on here. And it's not uh, that hard plastic that it's called 35 or 5355 plastic that you use on. Also, Instagram feed is about to die. Um, if you are on Instagram and want to continue watching, go on BRB Adventures AK on Facebook or just BRB Adventures. Uh, you should be able to find me pretty easily. Uh, Anyways, um, so your, your boot, it all, they all have to um, correspond to certain ISOs, so certain standards, so that you don't have manufacturers that are saying, here's my boot, and if you buy this boot, you have to also buy my ski and also buy my binding. So they, they made it so that can't happen because as I said before, skiing is already a ridiculously expensive sport. It doesn't need 
anything else like that for it. So by making these ISO standards, um, they made it a little bit easier for compatibility. But not everything is compatible with everything. And the main reason for that is because of your AFD plate here. I will be right back. He is out here at I need to attend to. I'll be back in 30 seconds. All right. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, didn't expect to be interrupted in here. But yeah. um, anyways, I'll have to cut that from the YouTube edit. Um, with AFD and tall height, the main reason why some bindings aren't compatible with some boots is because some bindings don't have an adjustable toe height and their toe piece is restricted to a certain distance right here. So if you have a fat boot in here, it's just simply never going to work. Or if you have a really skinny boot in a binding that has a bi uh, uh, binding toe piece that's meant for a touring binding, it's also not going to work. It's going to slip out of there all the time. And so, um, that compatibility is kind of the last check when you're getting bindings mounted or when you're getting them tested and adjusted is does your binding compatible is or rather is your compat compatibility really good? Um, and then can you set your toe height correctly your toe height it's weird sometimes even though you're compatible um setting your toe height is a lot harder than you would think so um the way that you set that on a bind like this um, it's just a screw right there. It's an Allen wrench and it pushes this up and down on this small track there that pushes up and down. Ugh, I really hope it's unfortunate. I couldn't use my own computer cause I have a much better camera, but I hope for episode two and on, I will be able to, um, again, I'm also really trying to, um, be able to read y'all's comments and everything like that. I really appreciate you guys sticking in here with me. I have never done anything live like this before. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of a new thing for me too. But I swear to gosh, before I could see this, no, I can't. Anyways, I'm just gonna keep going on. So you set your toe height correctly and then your binding is totally set up for your boot. Um, these bindings, the toe piece is almost exactly the same as the heel piece. The toe piece, the only difference is it's got something called toe wings. So where does that rental ski? So on a toe piece, your toe wings are what's controlling your boot going in and out of it. Because instead of popping out of your ski like this, now you're popping out of your ski like that. So you've got these toe wings right here, and that's what's controlling uh, your din, essentially. And so uh, same thing, as you tighten this screw, it tightens this uh, spring in here, and it makes it harder for these to move back and forth. This din is extremely light, it's 0.75, it's the lowest you can get, essentially. That's why I can move it with my fingers, just like that, with no problem. So, um, that is a ski binding. Um, and now I'm going to go over kind of um, snowboard bindings and then we'll go over the anatomy of your ski itself. The reason I want to do this this way is because um, the anatomy of a ski and a snowboard are much more similar than the bindings are. So I'd like to get all the differences um, kind of out of the way and then we'll talk about what's similar with these um, and how like we can pair about them in the same types of ways. So I'm gonna bring over some snowboards now. And the first thing we'll do is we'll look at a rental snowboard first. Now the reason we're gonna do it this way is because by looking at a rental snowboard, I can show you almost every single thing that you can change with the snowboard. Rental snowboards and rental bindings, despite being kind of loosey goosey and not the greatest product, are actually really, really good in terms of custom build, like custom ability. And if you go into it, uh, you can really make this your ski or sorry, your snowboard if you wanted to. Now, when we set up, set up as a shop, uh, like you bring it up to us normally, uh, any rental shop is going to set up on a standard. We're not going to go about figuring every single little thing out. But if you tell them, usually they will adjust it for you if you figure out what your settings are. 
That's the important thing is you really need to figure out what your settings are. Um, and don't just assume because you have something set up and it feels okay that it's the right setting on a snowboard. A lot of people are riding super weird duck feet, you know, super flailed out and super straight, things like that. Um, that is what's most comfortable for them and that's perfectly fine and they've probably toured around with it in a lot of different ways and ridden it one way one day and then a different way another day and then a different way another day to the point where now they actually know how those different things feel and they can tell what feels best. So, as I said, with this you can see almost everything. The way that this binding works, um, it just goes into this hole and it's super easy and I'm not going to really go into that because it's not something you guys need to know. What's nice about it is that because these bindings are variable, you can set them up in a ton of different ways. I think I'm actually going to bring the computer over here. So um, Instagram officially going bye bye. See you guys. Um, and that. So there you guys. And I'm going to take you guys over here so you can kind of see. So now you're on this snowboard with me. So, as I said, this little hole, it goes with that. Pretty easy to see how that makes sense. What's going on there? What is maybe a little bit harder to see is your angles and how everything else should be set up. So, first of all, you never want to be duck foot or inwards on a snowboard. The first thing that you can always change with the snowboard is the angle that the bindings are at and the space that the bindings are sitting away from each other. So if we really wanted to on this board, all those different holes, you can set them up in different places. So if you are short, but have long legs or wider, you know, bigger feet or something like that, you want it set farther away, you can do that. And then you can set up your angle. And your angle with these are really easy to explain because when that fits in that, actually that worked out perfectly, you then have a number here. I don't know if you guys can see that. There we go. You have a number there on the base plate and that corresponds to the angle that those are set up. And so right now they're set up at 12. And normally when we set up bindings, we set them up at 12 and 12 or nine and nine or 15 and 15. And that just gives kind of a comfortable, healthy stance for a snowboarder. Now, if I set this in that thing at 12, what's really important about setting snowboard bindings up is that you get your boots set over the center of all the straps. This is something that's really overlooked by a lot of snowboarders. It's, it's really crazy. But when you don't get your boots set correctly, your pressure is now pushing you in and out of your snowboard binding instead of allowing you to correspond your movements to your snowboard itself. Actually, that's a lot better now with the lights on. Huh? So I'm going to get a snowboard box boot. Snowboard boots, not really going to go over the anatomy of those guys. Anatomy of a ski boot is a little bit more complicated with walk to ride features and toe pins and stuff like that. And I'll go into toe pins in a little while. Um, but anatomy of a snowboard boot, it's basically a snow boot. Um, so, but you put them in here. And what you're looking for, and what people overlook all the time, is. Get you guys set up in my sock here. There we go. So what you're looking for here is this binding strap being centered over the middle of your boot. And so this one's actually pretty good. Actually, this is perfect, um, coincidentally, but it doesn't have to be. Anyways, so this, you can see, is centered completely over. But if I make this bigger, so now this is set the large setting. And then I tighten it. Now you can see this side is totally tight. And all the pressure on this boot is going over this way. And as a matter of fact, it doesn't even really fit right. But let's imagine it did. Your pressure is now coming down on your foot from this angle here. 
And that's not good. It's not allowing you to push down and make your turns and carve into your turns like you should normally be. Equally on the other side, obviously, the same thing would happen. But you get it centered, it'll be very nice. The other thing here is you have over the toe and on top of the toe bindings. These are on top of the toe. So you want that also centered. This one's a lot less important. Um, and on most bindings that aren't um, rental bindings, it's pretty easy to get this thing adjusted correctly. And most of them are over the toe. Uh, the reason for that being, I think snowboarders really prefer over the toe bindings. It kind of pushes your heel back into your boot correctly um, and makes it a little bit more stable in there. People, I think, really prefer them. Now, I, I ski and snowboard. I'm not an expert snowboarder, but I did learn in a way where I really learned the fundamentals and mechanics because you might be able to tell I really like that kind of thing. So um, I think I have a good grip on those things. Um, with skiing and snowboarding, though, if I end up explaining something that you're wondering if I said something wrong or something's not right, please reach out to me. Um, but yeah, as I said before, there's a couple of different ways to learn things, and there's also ways to learn things wrong and to learn them wrong for a long time. And that's kind of why I'm here, because I think I really have a good, strong grip over most of these things. But something as simple as waxing your skis, you might have been doing it for 20 years and doing it wrong the whole time. And I'm really not kidding about that. Um, people really mess up waxes that really permanently damage their skis all the time. Uh, so, yeah. So anyways, um, yeah, snowboard binding, a lot simpler um, in terms of how it actually um, interacts. It's not a moving part itself, um, but it has an equal amount of elements of setting it up correctly. That angle, the straps, and then the last thing that you really want to make sure of is your riser bar. And a riser bar is something that, believe it or not, until the other day, I didn't know that this same technology actually exists on skis, too. Um, Aaron, my, my boss, I imagine 80% of the people watching this know who Aaron is, but um, <laughs> she told me about it, some, something she had found for her kids, and she, she had known about it forever. Um, but apparently this technology also exists for skis, so keep that in mind. I'll show you what it looks like. I don't have the boots anymore, but I'll show you what it looks like in skis. So what a riser bar here is, is this little thing right here. So we're going to take the boot out. It's hard to adjust with it in. But the way this guy works, you can get it out. Oh, it's got a pin on this side for these guys. But when you adjust it, you can move it. These guys, this is a brand new one, so it's kind of stiff. But you can see I moved it up there all the way up. And that is disengaged. So disengaged, and then all the way down, that's engaged. And usually you want to keep it somewhere in the middle, but I'll show you what it looks like when it's completely disengaged. Let's tighten that down. You can now see the angle between the back of the binding and the cup is 90 degrees. This is sitting about 90 degrees as it goes up and down. When I adjust this down, it now acts, and I'll adjust it all the way down just as an exaggeration. But now you can see this angle is pushed way forwards. So that might be a little extreme, but I'll put it into a spot where you would typically see it. And that looks just about like that. So that push angle is now just a little bit, and it's pushing your heels forward is what it's doing. And so that might seem kind of weird and unintuitive, but in reality, that is an extremely useful tool for a lot of people, mostly kids. Um, and what that does is on skis and snowboards, you have a relaxed stance and an engaged stance. And when you're in your relaxed stance, that's honestly when you get a lot of your injuries because you're sitting flat, you're relaxing your legs and your muscles and your core muscles, and you're kind of just riding it out. When you're engaged, that's when you're actually getting set and starting to engage your turn. Now for skiers, it's not that different because engaging a turn forwards is intuitive. You're going down the mountain, downhill. You're going forwards, you're facing forwards. When you're going sideways on a snowboard, engaging your turns to go forwards that way is now a little bit less intuitive. 
And so there's tools to make that happen. And this riser bar is that main tool. So by pushing you forwards, you're now forcing your body into that engaged stance. Now, the reason why you wouldn't want that is because if you're forcing into that, you're stressing your muscles, or if you have big calves, or if you're a bigger person or a really advanced person, you're riding for 14 hours straight. You don't want that because it's a little bit more strain on your muscles. But what you do want as a beginner and intermediate is to have less time sitting flat and more time engaged into your turn. And as a matter of fact, for snowboarders under, gosh, seven, eight, 10, 13, 11, you know, into the teenage years, and even teenagers, I was a five foot eight, five foot nine, 125, 130 pound teenager. I would definitely benefit from something like this because I don't have the muscles to get myself into that stance and set and sit there for hours on end. If this can put me into that stance by itself, awesome. That's what we want. So specifically, or rather especially when people are going out for lessons, you wanna put them in that riser. But on a way more general term, figure out how that feels for yourself. And on your binding, there might be 10 different settings of that angle that you can put it at. Adjust that, see how it feels, and you might have a lot of luck really helping yourself engage those turns. I've seen a lot of broken bones off of flat snowboarders, and it really, really stinks when it could have been avoided. That's honestly why I don't snowboard all that much, <laughs> because I'm scared of sitting flat, not being engaged, catching an edge, and going over. If you are engaged properly on your riser bars, you lessen that chance by a whole heck of a lot. So, um, let's see. Um, I think that's pretty much everything. Uh, in terms of snowboard bindings. So now I'll start talking about things that are shared between skis and snowboards. Look at me all official with my notes and curriculum. It even says curriculum on the top of it. But uh, anyways, um, so you have a couple of main mater materials of the base of your skis or snowboards. And I'm gonna take this binding off just cause it's easier to mess around with. These brand new ones are real stiff, huh? Oh, the last thing for here, and most um, retail bindings are going to be like set kind of at where you need them, or you're going to have to buy a specific size for where you need it. But also being able to move this heel cut back and forth. If you have a size 18 foot, you're sitting right over the edge of the snowboard. That's obviously going to mess you up. You're going to be dipping your toe in or dipping your heel in. Uh, so you not only want to have a wider snowboard for a person like that, just in general, but you can adjust the binding too so that their heel cut goes back. So you're now more evenly distributing the overlap on both sides. So that's the last minor thing. So actually not gonna use this. The interesting thing about snowboards and a lot of rental equipment is their materials are totally different because they're made for elongated use and they're made for really stressful use. Um, over long periods of time with minimal upkeep and, and being used every single day. So they have a different base material, different core material, different things like that. And that's why I'm um, going about this kind of differently and showing you on a my ski again, essentially. Um, I'd like to get this up even higher if I can. So this core material, or sorry, base material on your ski is really, really simple. It's a patterned hard plastic material, and I can get a piece of it because every once in a while, somebody will damage their skis enough where they need a base material replacement. Now, a lot, most ski damage can be um, either grinded out or filled with PTEX, but this is what your base material looks like. Now, this is kind of old and has wax on it, but it's a simple non-patterned kind of smooth material and it's essentially just made to wick snow. And when you combine it with a bunch of other elements, you get this really, really awesome technology. And you get it working for you. That is the biggest thing in this whole workshop, is getting your gear working for you. Now this base material, some skis and snowboards, when you buy it, they'll tell you to get it ground and get a pattern put into it. That blows my mind that they wouldn't do it in the factory, but sometimes that is the case. 
And the reason they tell you that is because without those things, your snowboard or your, typically it's snowboards, but your snowboard or skis are useless. Uh, what's called quote unquote blank pair of skis, that is to say they're grinded flat and they have no damage and no pattern in them, has no structure or texture and actually won't really perform well at all. It'll stick to the snow, it's gonna be gross. Um, so what that structure looks like, it's really hard to see on kind of a neon ski like this, but if you go to a black based ski like this, and this is gonna be extraordinarily hard to see over this camera. But if you come into the shop and you have a question uh, or you wanna see this, I am more than happy to show it to you. But maybe you can see there's a crossing structure in this. There's these lines that are cross, oop, they're going the other way. They're crossing this way down the ski. I don't know if you can see that. I kind of can in my camera. But anyways, that's called your stone structure. And that exists in most skis and most snowboards. Um, and that structure is actually what helps you interact with the snow. People are obsessive about getting their base waxed and their edges sharp. But that stone structure is gonna do a hundred times more than both of those things. I have had skis where I've ridden them without the stone structure put in, whether I got it and didn't realize I needed to put a structure in it or something like that and just stuck immediately or skis that have gotten used and ridden like waxed it waxed it really well so it's perfectly hydrated and then went out and skied on it and it performed awfully the second you put that stone pattern back in it it flops it is night and day so if you look at the bottom of your ski and it looks just kind of blank and you keep getting waxes and you're like, man, I have to get a lot of waxes. It's kind of weird. I feel like my skis, well, your skis might be really old and dry, honestly. Um, we see a lot of that too. And belt waxes are great for that because it's a really quick hydration wax. But it also might be because you no longer have a pattern in your ski. And that's really important to make your ski function correctly. So it's called a stone pattern. And I'll go a lot more into that later. I'll go into how to set it at home for yourselves. Um, I'll go into all sorts of different things about stone patterns. The technicals about which pattern you want to put in for which conditions and how to reset your patterns and how to race with a pattern. I mean, it's really, really cool stuff. And when you get really nitty gritty into like World Cup racing and stuff like that, it, like the techs should be getting the gold medals, honestly. And, and the skiers will say that too. The, the skiers, at a certain point, they stop skiing their own or teching their own skis, and they have like U.S. ski hired packs, and they love that. You know, they're taking those guys out to dinner every night because having a well-tuned ski consistently week in and week out is night and day. And a lot of it has to do with intricacies of that stone pattern. One of the other really interesting things about edges, whether it be a ski or a snowboard, is something called base bevel. And bevel is a really unknown concept to most people, a really, really, really important one. So it's gonna be kind of hard for me to show you it, um, but there's a couple of ways I can show you kind of a picture of what base bevel looks like. So this is my edging machine right here, and this does everything you would do with a hand edger, except way more easily and quickly um, as a, a basically belt sander. And what I wanna draw your attention to is these knobs right here. And these guys are what's adjusting your base bevel. So this is your edge, this blue part right here. And your edge actually like dips into your ski. I can show you what that looks like. Sorry, that was kind of a disorganized um, section here. But this is what your edge looks like. Now, this part of your edge is the part of the edge that you're gonna see. This part of your edge is the part of the edge that is inside of your ski. And it's kind of welded in between your base material and your core material. And you will see when I talk about waxing next week that it is extremely easy to damage that edge material just from incorrectly waxing your skis. And it's easy to damage it in a lot of other ways. But we've got our 
bevel. This is real hard. We've got our bevel here, and this is showing you the edge, and that's the part of the edge that goes inside the ski. And this is the side bevel. So this one is showing you the angle that you're adjusting off of that side rev. So side bevel is typically one, two, or three degrees, and it can be decimal too, um, but it's going to essentially adjust the responsiveness of your ski. Now, most skiers are very rarely going to feel the influence of side and base bevel. And when we edge more, um, or like when we go into edging specifically, I'll talk a, a lot more detail about these things. Um, but what's interesting to think about is your base bevel, which is what that is, means that your ski is never actually sitting totally flat on the snow. And what your base bevel does is it changes the um, amount of time, essentially, and amount of strength it takes to get engaged onto your edge that one degree. So if you have a three degree base bevel, that means you have to roll over from your flat base to your three degrees before your ski kicks in and starts turning. If you have a zero degree base bevel, that's a 90 degree there almost. And what that would do is it would mean that even if you were sitting flat and went a tiny bit over onto one edge, you would catch and go that way. And that's why you never, ever want to use zero degree base bevel. Now, some people do. Um, typically, those people are detuning their skis really, really strongly so that they're um, kind of creating a flat section or a beveled section by itself, just manually. Um, but typically, you want at least one degree so that when you're starting to engage your turn, you're not immediately engaged in your turn. Instead, you're going and flowing into your turn and you're able to smoothly make that transition from one turn to another. So that's base bevel and skis and snowboards both have it. Um, and snowboards tend to be one degree and one degree. Like when I'm doing it in the shop, unless somebody were to tell me otherwise, I'm doing one degree and one degree on every single snowboard because it's a universal thing and it's what most people are gonna be used to. And so I don't want you know, snowboarders catching too much is a really, really bad thing. And if you undertune a snowboard, it's just completely unresponsive. But people would rather have an undertuned snowboard. Snowboarders really would rather have that undertuned than overtuned and what you call grabby. That's when you get really dangerous because that's when you're sitting flat and you catch that edge and go over and get it. So that's why you always want to use some sort of bevel um, for a ski and a snowboard. Um, should talk about the actual structure um, and shape of this ski or snowboard too though. A lot of people know about rocker and camber um, and most people know what they are generally. Rocker being your ski going out and camber being your ski going in. And generally speaking, you get camber underfoot and rocker on your tip and tip. It makes sense because you're pressing down underneath your underfoot section. You're kind of undoing that camber and that camber is allowing you to engage your uh, edges under your foot a little bit better. The rocker is taking your ski away from the snow and it's allowing you to engage your edges a little bit less. As a matter of fact, my ski right here, you can see the edge goes up, 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 up and then it stops right there. There's no edge here. This is just totally plastic. It's nothing. And that's because you don't ever need that edge on this rockered point. That's just to keep you floating above the snow. It's just to keep your tips up or just to keep your tails up. Now, let me actually show you some side-by-side -side skis so you can see. So here, Now I need you down low. So here you've got a little bit of camber underfoot. That's this separation right here. A little bit of camber. And then a ton. Yeah, I'll punch it up. 
a ton of rocker up here. I don't know if you guys can see this at all. It'd be a really big shame if you couldn't. But you can see right here is your rocker point. It's really low. And then from here on up, it's now getting wider. And it's pretty easy to see on your own skis. Now the old skis, we, we call them straight skis now, they had no rocker or camber. They were completely straight. If you hold them next to each other like this, everything touches. And then goes up a little bit of tips typically. Ours now have these crazy shapes, and these shapes are helping you react to different conditions of snow. And what's really cool about that is if you know exactly what you want, and you live in a place like Colorado, or let's do it better, Utah, where it's always kind of dry and powdery, certain high alpine snow, or you live in a place like Southeast Alaska, and it's always wet and kind of gross to be completely honest but sometimes ridiculously nice um you can get a ski that reacts to those different things better or worse um and most skis fall obviously somewhere along a long spectrum of how they deal with certain conditions but somewhere ever along that spectrum there's a ski that fits every single niche and by understanding your camber and rocker um you can really get a ski that works well for you. Personally, I really like for early and late season here in Southeast Alaska, a little bit of a more cambered or a straighter ski with a lot less angles in it. It means you can kind of get a truer turn all the way through your ski because you have more contact surface with your ski all the way along it. And when you get that in our, our wet snow or our corn snow in the spring, it leads to really nice, good, smooth turns through those, um, through those lines. So, and then, you know, in the middle of the seasons, I'll break out these guys, which are kind of a more powdery, but really an all mountain ski um, one way or another. So the one thing that you get, the one thing that you get in snowboards that you don't get much in skis is called magnet traction. And this might be another one that's really hard for me to show you guys. Um, but magnet traction is, it, I'm 99.9% .9 sure it was invented by LibTech. Um, almost all of the magnet traction technologies, things that are out there are LibTech. LibTech actually makes skis now too. So I said that you don't see this on snowboards, you see, or on skis, you see it on snowboards. Take that back two seconds later. Um, but only on LibTech skis. You won't see this technology anywhere else on skis. That being said, on snowboards, it's all over the place. So all the manufacturers slash um, you know, Black Diamond, everybody, uh, uh, Jones, they all have magnet traction edges now. Um, it's a technology that's really been picked up. So I'll show you what that means. Talking so fast, God. Stay, stay lubricated. So this edge, actually, yeah, you can see that even really easily. Woo! It's really, really weird. It goes up and down and up and down and up and down. If you saw that on a ski edge, you'd say, well, my ski is broken and I'm gonna throw it in the trash and you'd be right. But on a snowboard, it's actually a technology that they developed um, to hypothetically, um, and honestly, so many people have developed it or you know begun using it that I have to imagine it works really well. Um, but it gets you engaged under your turns a little bit better. So what it does is they make it so that those outer sections are in between your feet and the inner sections are right under where your foot is. And that means that when you engage your turn, everything around where your foot is, is engaging first. So it'll engage and then you can lay in even another level on this inner part right here where your foot is lying. And it's just uh, something to, um, Again, theoretically make it easier to turn, easier to engage your turns and get truer turns as well as um, to make the board a little bit wider. So there's ways to kind of cheat the system. So a wider board is typically gonna float a little better. A longer board with a more rocker tail is typically gonna float a little better. But if you cheat and give it a little bit of mega traction or you cheat and um, do a little bit of camber rocker uh, in the right spots, you can make it react like um, you want, 
but with a shape that might be a little bit more versatile for the other side of things. So instead of being super fat and wide, where it's really a one-dimensional ski or snowboard, now you have a little bit of a thinner one that you could use in the, you know, maybe in the groomer or the hard pack or whatever it might be, but also can take off um, and use whatever. So um, that's what magnet traction kind of is. And again, use the snowboard technology. Lib Tech, you guys are weird with your skis. Sponsor this video. Don't sponsor it probably since I just said you're weird. But, um, anyways, um, yeah, and then, and then uh, you know, adjusting that rocker and camber and where it is, you know, you're almost never going to get like a hard rocker underfoot. But you can play with, I mean, you can make crazy things. And actually, the high school here um, has a ski and snowboard press where they can make skis and snowboards. And I see a lot of homemade things come in um, because it's just a cool experiment and a kind of relatively cheaper way to make your own thing. And what that kind of goes back to what I talked about maybe a half hour ago with stone patterns and grinding flat, where those people who make their own products and then come to me, they want it ground completely flat in a stone pattern setting because that's their last finishing touch. That's what's going to make it from just being a plank of wood with some base material and some edges on it to being a rideable working machine that's going to react and going to be awesome for you. So, um, you know, it comes down to those things, uh, those small little things make a huge difference when you add them all up. And that's what I want you guys to get is to not only understand what's going on when you tune your skis or when you tune your skis, but to know if you bring me your skis, that I've done something or any shop tech. I don't mean not advertising myself at all. I got plenty of work. I'm swamped. <laughs> I mean, bring, bring stuff in. I, I want your work. I want to work on your stuff and I want to help you. Um, but when you bring things to me, you now know what I've done. And if something is a little bit different than what you wanted, you know how to fix it. And you, or you can translate that to me and say, hey, you know, last time it was a little grabby off the tail or whatever. Can you just be doing a little bit harder? 100% for sure. Or whatever it may be. Can you set my feet up a little wider or whatever? Um, you know, I encourage all snowboarders, and I don't know how many snowboarders I'll have walking, um, because to be completely honest, snowboarders, because their technology is on the face a little bit simpler, they tend to not really think about it as much. Um, but, you know, I, I just want um, everybody to get better um, and to be able to think about these things and make themselves better skiers and snowboarders. Um, so I, um, yeah, so, so, you know, when you make a stone pattern or when you polish a ski versus a snowboarder, when you're polishing it, it's pretty much the same. Stone patterns can be kind of different. Um, if you have somebody who's heavy switch rider or who rides in very different conditions often, um, you can use a polishing, um, belt. So that's essentially a, a sanding belt, but instead of sanding and grinding down more material, um, you're actually putting a pattern into it with while you're grinding it. And so that's a really what good way to polish a snowboard and make it a little bit more versatile riding both directions. As skiers, you know, some people are like hardcore switch riders and love to ride big mountain switch and, that, and that's super cool, super duper rad, good on them. And I have people who have me mount their skis in a way where they'll specifically say, please me mount this so I can ride switch and powder. Sure, that's not that hard to do. You just set it so that you're a little bit more in the middle of the ski because normally you're sitting a little bit back on it so that you're a more leverage and powder. So when you're sitting in the middle of it, now if you're going backwards, you have the same amount of leverage as you have going forwards or float as you have going forwards. Um, but yeah, for the most part, um, you can really polish these things and stone grind them in the same way, regardless of whether it's a ski or a snowboarder, um, unless you're doing it by your hands and then you can do it however you want. Um, and and that's really the awesome thing about it is you can you can tune everything. Um, so I will before I stop here. Uh, probably the most important section, which I probably should have done when the most amount of people were on here, and I probably should have done it right off the bat. Um, but anyways, I want to go over what you might need in terms of materials for this course. 
Um, it's going to be probably five weeks. Um, and I don't expect people to spend a ton of money on these kinds of things. It's really at your own. You could use this as a, to a total educational thing, um, or you can use this as a clinic where you want to go and start doing these things. And I promise after this week, we'll get hands on. I'll give you guys, I'll figure out how I, how I can look at the comments and the questions and stuff like that. Um, and I'll give you guys some time to either get on camera and show me some of your progress while you're waxing and edging and stuff like that and ask, is this what this is supposed to look like? Um, and get feedback and stuff like that. So I might start a little bit earlier so we can run a little bit longer. Um, or it's not all that late anyways. It's just dark is all happy out there. <laughs> but, uh, um, anyways, so for the edging, or sorry, for the waxing section, because that's probably the thing that the most people are going to be engaged in terms of doing at their home. Um, for the waxing section of this, what you'll need is an iron. Um, do not use your home iron. You're going to ruin your skis. Um, but you want a ski iron. Looks something like this. It's got a little dial for temperature. It's relatively flat. Usually has some sort of texture on the bottom there. Um, some of them are totally flat. I like it with a little texture because it makes it not get as hot. Um, and what you, I would rather have anything too cold than too hot. Um, but mine also get just absolutely destroyed because I use them thousands of times a year. Um, so you could get a product that was a little bit more sensitive because you personally couldn't know that um, you're going to take good care of it and everything. And I, I take good care of them, but it's impossible with <laughs> how much work I do. Um, so this is number one. Um, bars of wax are really the only other thing that goes along with that. Um, this is universal wax, warm wax. I'm going to put together, I, we up here at Eagle Crest are not going to be selling um, irons. We will be selling almost everything else for this. So we will sell bulk wax. I'm going to put together little packs where I cut these bars in half and give you guys each temperature so you can try it out um, as well as mix your own temperatures. This is a really cool practice, especially racers will use. Literally take a heat gun to the snow, see the temperature of the snow and mix your wax exactly to that temperature for the glide. Now, if you're going to do that, you need to obviously do it every day or go back the next day and use just like a universal or something like that. Um, but we can do really cool things with wax. So we're going to put a bunch of packs together for you guys. If you want to buy bulk wax from us up here at Eagle Crest, um, we'll also have scrapers. So obviously again, <laughs> super used scraper. All this is going to be is to scrape your wax off at the end of the waxing process. You'll see why it's really important. They're really cheap. We have them up here. I just ordered a bunch more. Um, and then the really good website for all of this stuff is svst.com. Um, they're really awesome. Sun Valley uh, Ski Tools, uh, really small little company um, out of Idaho. Awesome to work with. They have everything you can need. But, you know, with shipping up here, especially if you guys are coming tuning in from Alaska, it's kind of a pain. So wherever you can find it, I know Foggy, NAO, they probably have some scrapers. We're ordering more, as I said, but depending on how much viewership this, this gets, we'll see. So you'll definitely need a scraper. Absolutely will need this, super cheap and easy to get. And then the last two things you'll need is these two brushes. Now these are not the most mandatory thing ever. This, sorry, this one probably a little bit more. This is your polishing brush. Um, what I'll use this for is before I edge, we'll clean your ski with it. So this is a nylon brush is what it's called. Uh, I believe this is a 12 in, or a 12 centimeter nylon brush. This is a six centimeter, uh, actually it's probably millimeters, millimeters, uh, I don't know. Anyways, um, this is a horsehair brush. This is your polishing brush. This is really nice to have. Up here at Eagle Crest, we have both of these. Limited quantity, obviously, of all of this kind of stuff. We couldn't order a ton because I didn't know how much viewership this was gonna get. Uh, but these are gonna be really, really crucial for you to make things really nice and polished. That's basically everything you're going to need for the uh, waxing segment of all of this. Um, when you go into edging, your, your tools get a little bit more complicated. So when you're edging, you not only need a good set of files. This is a racing file. Um, there's a number of different file makers, diamond files. Um, what's this? This guy is called Ice Cut. The Ice Cut file range is really good. Those are the ones I ordered a bunch of these as well. 
um, up here at Eagle Crest, an ice cut file. That's gonna be your hand edger. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, that's something you really want. Typically we'll get an eight inch file, a six inch file is fine too. Um, eight inches is just a little bit easier to get onto your edger. Then what you need is either an edging guide like this. So this is a two degree guide. You can see the angle on it set, Jesus, says 92. That means it's a 92 angle or uh, degree, which means it has a 2% angle on it. So typically what you're gonna want is a 91 and a 92. That's what I say is great to start with. It's gonna be your intro. What that's gonna allow you to do is, I mean, this isn't the right thing at all, but when you put your file on there essentially, when you grind it out, then that's gonna give you that two degree or that one degree angle. So your guide, the tiles, and then if you wanna get really polished about it, your diamond stones. So this is a mini stone. Um, it's good for edging with a file guide. Also can look like this. Um, this goes over your ski edge with your file. Sorry, it's gonna go over your ski edge and your file's gonna sit on top here. Uh, but that's really hard to demonstrate without a ski on it. Um, but your diamond cut stones are going to uh, allow you to polish your edge really finely. So it's just like rock polishing. Your diamond cut stones can go from 100 to 150, 200, all the way up to, I think the finest cut stone is 800. That's an 800 grit sandpaper essentially that you're doing in that. When you feel that stone, it literally feels like silk. It's so fine. Um, that's what this guy is. That's what the pink stone is. But these look just like you would think. It's a really fine, fine polishing file. Um, and getting a series of these is pretty nice if you're trying to do a really specific race polish. Now, I'd say about 99% of you are not going to be getting into that. Although, if you come and get edged from me and then go back and do your own polish, that will make your edge better. So, if you weren't interested in edging and getting your own set of ice cut files, you could get diamond stones and that's gonna allow you to set your edge and get things really specific as well. So that's kind of a choice up to you guys. A um, Couple other things, file guides, there's one, that, that looked like this and this. Um, lots of different types of file guides out there. The Swiss guides work really well. All the ones on SVST work really well. Do a little bit of research outside this. A simple Google search, five minutes will get you, um, you know, all the information that you would need for the connect. So that's edging. Um, past that, things get a little bit more complicated. So, Simple PTEX, which is what's going to be used for base repair mostly, just looks like this. It's just a plastic that you can melt into your base and it essentially simulates a base, seals it up, makes it waterproof, um, and prevents any further damage. That being said, what you need for a lot of base repairs is something called base weld. And this base, this is called metal grip. Sorry. Did not mean base weld. Base weld is also something you need. Um, but this is metal grip. Uh, base weld is gonna help you, um, it's kind of like metal grip. It helps you get that new base material in there if you ever have a big section of base that you need to cut out. Um, but typically with most materials, unless it is hugging the edge, you can use metal grip, which is basically the same thing as this PTEX, except this will stick to almost everything. Um, so a lot of times when you make repairs with this kind of PTEX, you literally burn it drip it in and let it set, set in 30 seconds, two minutes, you know, a pretty short amount of time. But then you go to file it out and sand it, or sand it out and flatten it out with a metal edge and it pops right out. Now your work is done and it really sucks, um, but it happens all the time. And so metal grip is really nice for that. Um, for base repairs, you're also going to need a um, metal file or a metal scraper that looks like, oh, I'm sorry. I, I forgot one or two things for edging actually as well. So I'll show you what the metal fire looks or scraper looks like. It's just like this, just looks like one of those plastic ones, but it's metal instead. 
couple things, sorry, for edging that you will need as well. Um, this is a detuning stone. Super duper 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 nice to have a good one of these that you've maintained well. They do a really good job. And the last thing that you might need um, is a gummy stone. This is a hard gummy stone. This is also going to be a detuner, but it's also going to help you get all of those burrs off the edge. Now, when I'm edging with the um, belt, I'm using uh, gloves and honestly, an apron and some gloves, really good idea um, for this, but you can really use any old gloves, even gardening gloves, as long as you can feel things well in them, that'll work just fine. Um, but these detuning uh, and these hard gummy stones we have up here at Eagle Crest as well. Um, and these are really nice for just taking, when you when you hand tune, you create a lot more burrs. And those burrs going in your hands, trust me, my hands used to hurt all winter long for, for three, four years because I wasn't wearing gloves. Um, and it was, so, um, these guys are really nice for that as well. Um, so back to, back to base repair, uh, that P-Tex, really good um, metal grip really good you're gonna need a metal scraper um, so that you can start to level out your base and then honestly from there it's gonna be really hard without getting a professional base grind uh, to get your set level uh, what you can use is a true bar true bar is really nice for both setting your bevel and checking your bevel angle and also for getting everything level um, with your base you can just simply set it on your base and you can see spots and they're not level um, and then a, um, this is not a horsehair brush, it's a copper brush. And the copper brush like this will help you set your own stone pattern. So this is how you can manually set a stone pattern without having us grind it in. Now this will never be as good as a machine ground pattern ever, but it's really good for doing your own work or for doing spot repairs and stuff like that. So that's pretty much what you need for base repair. Um, again, a lot of those things, you might need them, you might not need them. Um, it's really up to you about how in depth you want to go to it. I mean, every single thing in here, and this is only one wall of my five walls of tools, um, it is useful and you could make a reason why you would want to own it, but it's not something that you absolutely need. And especially if you have a shop that you trust, having them do something that might take them 20 minutes and might take you six hours to do, and you probably still won't even get it you know, done quite as timely, let them take care of it for the most part. Um, but if you want to mess around with these things, you definitely can. I mean, before there were machines, there were people who were tuning all these kinds of things. So, um, yeah, so from there, and we'll go into, as I see, um, kind of how many people are sticking around and what the interest is for those more fine repairs and all that kind of stuff. Um, I might go towards a little bit more um, uh, like educational or a little bit more hands-on depending on what I want to or what the feedback I get from you all. Um, again, I really hope, I see a lot of you have stuck around. Um, that's really awesome. I'm really sorry that I couldn't see um, your comments and everything like that. I promise I'll get that up for next time. Um, I really feel bad because at the end, I really wanted to do a Q&A session. That was really important for me um, to be able to see your comments and be able to do a Q&A. Um, oh, I can see them now. I see. Okay. So, well, I already ran past most of these. Um, but yeah, sorry. Um, if any, so I guess I can see the comments now. Uh, if any of the 10 people remaining um, have any questions, please feel free to um, shoot them out. I uh, really appreciate you guys staying around. I recognize a lot of y'all's names. See a lot of your skis, see a lot of your kids' skis and stuff like that. Um, but you know, and, and, and as I said, um, a shop is just going to kind of do things a little bit better, um, or not necessarily a little bit better, but pretty fine and pretty quickly and pretty cheaply. Um, but if you are into this kind of thing, it's really satisfying to be able to hand tune your stuff and to get it acting the way you want it to. And then to have this finished product and going out in the snow and just flying past your friends or making way sicker cars because you're just able to understand your equipment a little bit better. Um, so I don't see anybody really popping out too many questions right now. Um, but again, thank you all for joining. Next week, we're going to go into waxing. Um, might go into edging a little bit. I'm really glad I figured out how to do the comments here. I'm sorry that took literally the entire video. Um, but uh, I, 
more people are coming in now. So if you guys have any questions, um, please let me know. Um, but yeah, if not, um, yeah, next week, um, I'll be going over waxing a little bit. You got all week, come up here and see us. Um, if you need any of those tools, um, and definitely come talk to me if this was helpful or if there's other things you want to see. Um, yeah, what, one thing I wanted, um, actually, yeah, Amanda, this is a really, um, that's a really good question and something I kind of glossed out or rather skipped over that was on my actual list earlier is what is the regimen for new skis? You get that question a lot. I just got brand new skis and I get them waxed and, and set to my boots and tuned up. My answer to that is yes, I can set them to your boots. No, I won't wax them. They actually come with a factory wax that used to be really, really crap. Um, but now it's actually a pretty decent factory wax and it comes with a factory polished and hand polished edge. So it'll typically have a little bit of serration on it um, and it's, it's a pretty good edge. So you wanna use that until you can't use it really anymore. So typically it's four or five uses out here in Southeast cause it's so wet. Sometimes it's a little less, sometimes after a couple uses, you're like, oh my God, I'm sticking like crazy, I can't move. Um, but I say after that, get your beginning of the season, always wanna get a hot, hot wax. Get a nice hot wax in there, get all of that permeation back into your core, get it feeling like you can literally feel how good it and how smooth it is and, and how polished it is. And then after that, if you start noticing chapping or sticking, stick with the belt waxes. Um, those are really, really helpful, super cheap way to do it. And it takes about 30 seconds um, and you can just get them done here. Um, or you can use a hand wax, a high octane wax or something like that. Do it every, every couple times you ski. I mean, honest to God, every shop tech, every skier will tell you, wax your skis every single time if you can. And that's the truth is I wax those red skis probably every single time I ski with them. But I'm also spoiled and can just work them into a queue of all y'all skis and just wax my own. Um, but I'd say every, you know, a hot wax, maybe twice a season, get one at the beginning, one in the middle. And then if you need one at the end, get one. If it's like a long season, it's going into spring and it's, it's rad like last year was, get another one at the end of the season before you put your summer wax on there. Um, and then just hydrate it in between. And honestly, it sounds like a lot of money, but if you're doing it yourself, that whole thing is gonna cost you maybe 20, 30 bucks each season. And once you have the, the wax and have the iron and all that kind of stuff, all that overhead is done. And you know, it's really not all that bad. Plus you can come up here and get that belt wax in 30 seconds, you know, get your pants on and well, hopefully you don't come with no pants on, but you know what I mean? <laughs> and get ready to go and, and your board will be ready or your skis will be ready. So um, thank you for asking that Amanda. Um, that's, that's a great question. Something I, I really wanted to talk about. Um, if anybody has any other questions, feel free to shoot them out in the text, but Otherwise, this is going to be on YouTube. Um, I'll post it under my page, BRB Adventures. Um, and yeah, same place, same time next week. Um, hopefully this video quality came out well. It sounds like you guys can hear and see me pretty well. So I'm glad uh, you guys could tune in and hope to see you all next week.